Ezekiel Sims. He was in the Amazon with my mom when she was researching spiders right before she died. Oh, Sony, you lovable scamps. You've done it again, but why? Madame Web is out and after the meme show that was the trailer, it will come as no surprise to anyone that the film is absolutely terrible and has bombed at the box office. But that isn't what I'm here to talk about today. I've not actually even seen the film and if I'm being perfectly honest, I probably won't until it hit Netflix. Actually, I'm just sitting in front of a green screen in my living room. But what I actually want to talk about is the burning question that I keep seeing people asking but not answering. And that is, why do Sony keep making these awful Spider-Man spin-off films? I think there are four reasons that break down into three interrelated categories. Licensing, the need for content, and money. Let's start with licensing. Sony bought the rights for Spider-Man way back in 1997 from a Marvel still reeling from Chapter 11 bankruptcy the year prior for a flat fee of $7 million, which when you take into account the fact Spider-Man has become one of the most valuable IPs on Earth, is frankly daylight robbery. Although, as it turns out, this absolute bagging did come with quite a few Faustian clauses as revealed by Planet Money on NPR. Sony must commence production on a new Spider-Man film within three years, nine months and release it within five years, nine months after the release of the preceding picture. Basically, if Sony doesn't release a Spider-Man related movie every five years and nine months until the end of time, the rights revert right back to uh, Marvel. So that's reason number one. If Sony ever stops making Spider-Man movies, they lose the film rights to one of the most valuable characters known to man. I hope I don't need to explain why that would be a terrible thing for their share price. Now, you might be thinking, why don't they just make Spider-Man movies instead of these god-awful spin-offs then? Bringing us to the other Faustian deal Sony has signed over the recent years. We've already established that Sony has to release a Spider-Man movie just shy of every six years, and they did just that, releasing five Spider-Man movies over a 12-year stretch, first releasing the largely well-received Sam Raimi trilogy between 2002 and 2007, although I think everyone hates the last one, before releasing Matt Webb's duology in 2012 and 2014. Only problem was, the Mark Webb films weren't very well received, so a planned third film was cancelled, with the Sony email leak showing although the films grossed over $700 million, Sony expected to make way more and only ended up just making a profit because they blew everything on marketing, thus leaving Sony with a bit of a quandary. They need to release a Spider-Man film but can't really reboot the series for a third time within 15 years without losing a boatload of money, which uh, they hate doing. Thus they struck a deal with Disney so that Sony would uh, release Spider-Man films within the MCU. They'd get to keep 95% of the gross and more importantly, Kevin Feige would sprinkle some of that MCU magic dust around the place and they'd make boatloads of money at the box office as a result. It does however mean that Sony can't release their own movies with Spider-Man in them. Hence they are stuck releasing these weird spin-off films for as long as this agreement with Disney holds. So that's reason number two. Sony contractually can't use Spider-Man in their own weird little Sony Spider-Verse they have going on because, well, he's being pimped out to Disney. Which brings us to the last Faustian licensing pact Sony has managed to get themselves into. That also crosses over into our next category of reasons they are stuck making these Spider-Man spin-off movies. Unlike almost every other studio, Sony took the very shockingly sensible decision to just license out their IP to uh, streamers rather than setting up their own ruinously expensive service that nobody wants, like everybody else did. They own Crunchyroll, which is just for anime, and I believe they bought that from AT&T back in 2021, but they don't have a streaming service for live action TV and movies. 
As a result, they signed deals with Netflix and Disney for them to get first and second streaming rights to Sony's film releases. Over the five years of the agreement, it is worth $3 billion or $600 million a year. Only problem is, Sony Pictures have a distinct lack of recognisable franchises they can regularly pump out to fulfil all of these deals. Which brings us to our next problem for Sony that forces them into relying on the Sony Spider-Verse spin-off series. Looking back at their last five years of releases beyond the Web Slinger, they have a lot of franchises that are played out or have been rebooted to within an inch of their lives. When added to the above deals means they're kind of locked into endlessly relying on Spider-Man, both at the box office and as a make weight in any licensing deals they make with streamers, because let's be honest, nobody is paying 600 million a year for the Insidious franchise rights. And seeing as they can't use Spider-Man, they are left trying to make Spider-Man movies without the web slinger himself. So that's reason number three. Sony doesn't have any other reliable A-list franchises it hasn't already run into the ground it can rely on to fill out its release schedule. Bringing us to the last category, money. Now, this is probably going to shock quite a few people, but one of the main reasons Sony keeps making these films is it's making them a quite a lot of money. Don't believe me? Let's look at the figures. The Spider-Man MCU trilogy has made almost $4 billion at the box office. Sony's own weird little spin-off verse has so far made just over $1.5 billion from a combined budget of only around $365 million, which is well into profit territory. Because, again, in a shockingly sensible move, Sony has kept the budgets for their own superverse really rather sane by Hollywood standards. With the films coming in at around the $90 million mark, as opposed to Disney, who seemed to think that, you know, something like the Marvels needed a budget close to $300 million. Where when you factor in they are already making $600 million a year from streaming rights and only release around 10 to 15 movies per year, they've already covered about half the budget of these Spider-Man films without even factoring in box office numbers. Admittedly, this is very rough back of the fag packet maths, but he's just here to illustrate what Sony's strategy is with these films. That being, to keep them cheap, around 80 to 90 million with up to two thirds of the budget, then being essentially covered by Netflix and Disney via streaming rights, with the box office being icing on the cake at that point. So that's reason number four. Sony are making money from releasing these films as they've cleverly made them cheap and already covered at least half of the production budget via licensing deals. When you add all four reasons together, making these flicks makes a whole lot of corporate sense for Sony. As to why they are universally terrible, that's a topic for a whole different video someday, maybe. If you want to see that, let me know down in the comments and consider even subscribing. Thanks for watching and I'll hopefully catch you in the next one.